They say that our thoughts, the automatic ones, are just that, automatic. Pieces of brain matter and energy zooming around our psyche. They say that our inner observer, the one who notices the thoughts, is our true self. I ponder tonight as I'm eating mac and cheese, having tried to lay down to sleep multiple times already. If we're emotionally enmeshed with our thoughts, if we're in a codependent relationship with our own mind, I wonder if by letting go, our energy grows more powerful. I've been trying to control my mind, talk to it, reason with it. I've tried to show it other ways to do its job. I've read to it, drawn for it, danced with it. I've cried with it, lost sleep over it, and cradled it. I've enabled it given it more power than it's capable of handling, I've become controlled by it. I'm observing this now as I write, and little by little with every day that passes, the observer has become an enabler. I think this is why journaling is the key to transcending the codependence on our thoughts. When we journal or write in any fashion, when we transform thought energy into physical matter, we become more able to use our senses to observe it. It becomes tangible. There, in tangibility, it can be properly observed. We can read our writing aloud and hear it. We can see our thoughts on paper. We can feel the imprint of the letters we've written with our fingertips. We can feel the consonants with our tongues and lips. We can feel the reaction we have to it in our bodies, our emotions. We say that we have sight, touch, smell, taste, and hearing. Those are our senses. But consider emotion. Is it not just another sense? Is an emotional reaction not just information about a situation surrounding the scenario that we have to perceive and process and catalog? When we see something we don't want, we close our eyes, we look away. When we hear something we don't want, we try to plug our ears or blast something louder. When we smell something we don't want, we plug our noses or try to smell something more pleasant, and so on. So it seems self-explanatory then that when we think something we don't want, we try to distract ourselves with pleasure, entertainment, or exhilaration. When we feel something we don't want, we try to numb ourselves, distract ourselves, and when we fail to block it, We punish ourselves. It's a mechanism for control. It's a cycle of failure, inevitable failure, characterized by mental health disorders, chemical imbalances, physical health problems, lack of fulfillment, erratic behaviors, etc. So essentially, we block ourselves from perceiving the world around us as it is, and we don't fully process the information we receive about the world. Minor sensations come and go, escaping our awareness. We don't accurately or consciously observe it when it's happening. We don't utilize our gifts, our senses, our minds, the way we were designed. Our place in the world then escapes us too, doesn't it? How do we know when we block our ability to process? We don't let things be. We desperately grab hold of what's familiar and try to recreate it. This evening, my tea yogi teas, gave me some wisdom that I photographed. Quote, master the unknown by knowing your deep self. End quote. How do we know something? How do we truly know it? By experiencing it? No? By observing it? By reading about it? Talking about it? Learning about it? Seeing it? Hearing it? Feeling it? No? Do we know something by controlling it? Do we know something by punishing it? Do we know something by ignoring it? Do we know something by telling it to be different? No. So it can be reasoned then for an observer to transcend. They must not learn to control their mind, but rather to let it go and watch it be. Which leads me to my next pondering. Does the observer learn self-love only when he or she lets go of themselves? their ideas of who they think they are, should be, or need to be? Do we only learn self-love when we allow a safe place for us to just be? Isn't that what we do for the ones that we love? We allow them safety. We allow them to feel. We validate and encourage and inspire them to grow. But we do not try to control them. We do not try to force things upon them. Healthy and true love is simply creating space, isn't it? It is holding. It is warming. It is welcoming. 
It is watching over. It is being. I have fought to wrangle in myself, gather what I can of her, and slap a label on her that provides a useful ideation to the masses. She's resisted me. Strongly. She refuses containment, constructs, and control. Even if she acquiesces for a while, she mocks me in her rebellion, flipping a switch in an instant. I told my ex-husband over the phone recently that the old me has died. And in her death, she became new. She became me. And I know I will die one day too. The me that I am in this moment. I feel her death coming. And with it, another creation anew. And this leads me to the question that I will end on today. What does this practice look like in everyday life? How does this fit in with a day-to-day existence in an environment out of our control? I know grounding. I know nature. I know journaling. I know breathing. I know creation, art, dance, music, poetry, writing, and others I may be forgetting. But is there a structure? Is the structure different person to person? These things I will ponder a different day. I feel tired now and I will give myself rest.